Hi, I'm Matt Smith, and this is Spark Spread. Today is part two of our valuation series, and in this video, we're going to be going over the detailed assumptions and outputs of Tesla's automotive business. In our last video, we established a total value for Tesla of just over $2,900. Tesla's automotive hardware component of that is just $328. However, the assumptions that we use here today are major drivers of the full self-driving and robo-taxi valuations that we'll get into in our next video. So we'll take a minute to walk through some of those assumptions and do some sensitivity analyses. So we'll spend some time looking at key variables like deliveries, and we'll see how changes to those assumptions can impact the overall share price calculated. Let's get into it. So now we are back into the pure automotive sales section of the model. We did briefly go over this in the previous video, but today we'll spend a little bit more time going over some of the more detailed assumptions in the buildup. So as you can see here, we are forecasting deliveries by both model type and by uh, facility. So we have Fremont, Shanghai, Berlin, and Austin. Those are the known facilities which have manufacturing capability today or are under construction today. We do know that there will be future factories and future models that are produced, such as the Model 2 or whatever they end up calling it, as well as the Roadster and the semi-truck. Uh, it's not clear exactly where each one of those will be built, so we have a sort of catch-all line here called future factories and models that accounts for all of those additional models rather than trying to allocate exactly where they will be built. Since this is a quarterly look and we go out to the year 2030, it can be pretty hard to take away any trends in this data. So over here we do have a summary table which does give the annualized breakout both by facility and by model. So you can see here, I'm assuming 12 and a half million units by the year 2030. So I'm clearly not giving Tesla credit for the full 20 million units that Elon has said is the goal by 2030. Uh, I do think it's certainly possible, but for purposes of valuation, I don't want to give Tesla full credit for everything that they've promised. Rather, I'd prefer to leave a little bit of room on the upside and on the downside, as I've said before. I did want to run a sensitivity analysis to understand what the impact of both higher and lower deliveries would be on the overall share price that we calculated. Let's start with the bull case. Uh, if we do assume 20 million units by the year 2030, that gives us a share price of $3,500 per share. On the other hand, if we only assume 5 million units by the year 2030, we get a share price of just over $1,900. Now keep in mind that this does not change any of the underlying assumptions about autonomy or full self-driving. So $1,900 to $3,500 is not necessarily the full range of my bear and bull cases. In fact, I think autonomy in particular is such a binary outcome that the bear case may hover around $800 or so, with a huge step change up to $1,900 or higher if true level five autonomy and robo taxis really do become a reality. But again, for purposes of this analysis, we are only changing one variable at a time. Uh, so we'll get into those sensitivities on full self-driving prices and take rates, as well as the robo-taxi pricing and uh, assumptions around that in a later video. But let's keep going through the model so you can see the other components of it. Not only do we need to look at the total number of deliveries, but we also need to make projections around the amount of vehicles which will be leased. Historically, that number has hovered around 7 or 8%, and I'm assuming roughly 8% on average going forward. We then have a tracker to keep count of the total active leases that Tesla has across all of their vehicles. This is important not only to calculate a more accurate revenue projection for leases, but also because Elon has said in the past that vehicles coming off of leases would be used in Tesla's robo-taxi fleet. So that is what I've assumed here. We do have here in row 64 a binary assumption on whether or not robo-taxis are available in each quarter. So you can see here that I've assumed robo-taxis will start to be used in Q1 of 2023. So from that point on, all of the vehicles coming off lease would no longer be resold for a slight margin, but would instead be put into Tesla's robo-taxi fleet. For purposes of this part of the valuation, that actually results in a reduction of the resale revenue, so it does slightly lower the valuation of this hardware component of the valuation, although it's more than made up for on the robo-taxi side of the equation. But you can see in this interim period, we do have a small amount of revenue, which is the vehicles coming off of lease, which are then resold by Tesla. Uh, next we have pricing. Keep in mind that the pricing here is only for the hardware components of the vehicle. So full self-driving, but also acceleration boost or any of the other software upgrades that are available to users are not included in this price. Now, since we do have relatively aggressive assumptions on increasing total sales from around 500,000 in 2020, 
all the way to 12 million in 2030, I do think it's important to be realistic with your pricing. In order to increase sales by that amount, you really do need your pricing to come down so that your total addressable market grows. For this reason, I've assumed across the board price cuts of around 5% per year every year. So you can see pricing decreases in Q1 of each year. We're then using these prices in conjunction with the delivery numbers that we've shown above to calculate total lease revenues as well as total new sales revenues. These are done by model and then aggregated into total vehicle sales. So in row 86 here, we have total lease revenue. In row 97, we have total new vehicle sales revenue. And then we are adding in below that used vehicle sales, lease revenue, regulatory credits, and then services and other revenue. This gets to a total revenue line, which is calculated in row 101. Now, an important point around regulatory credits. I do think these will be around for the foreseeable future, but I did not want regulatory credits to be a major driver of valuation in this model. For that reason, I've capped them at 300 million per quarter starting in the year 2022 and eliminated them completely by the year 2025. So next we have an average sales price number. This is really sort of a sanity check. As I just explained, we want to be sure that the average sales price for Tesla is decreasing over time so that we can have better justification for the relatively aggressive growth assumptions that we have on the vehicle deliveries. Now Q1 2021 is a little bit of a low point and that is simply due to the relatively low mix of Model X and Model S that I'm expecting based on the line shutdown that happened in Fremont. But in Q2 that normalizes back out and we have a average sales price of around $46,000 excluding software sales. So you can see that decreases over time and by the year 2030 we're getting down to around $24,000 per vehicle. At this price point I do feel confident that Tesla would be able to sell around 12 million vehicles per year. At an average sales price of $24,000 the upfront purchase price would be lower than a comparable internal combustion engine vehicle. On top of that, there would be lower fuel and maintenance costs going forward, so it seems pretty clear to me that the total addressable market at this price point would be quite high. Next, let's talk about manufacturing margins. As I've detailed in previous videos, I do think it's possible to come up with a reasonable estimate of Tesla's manufacturing margin. If you make assumptions around Tesla's FSD take rate, as well as the percent that is recognizable under GAAP standards, you can back those revenues out and come up with a core manufacturing margin. In Q3 2020, I estimated that Tesla's core manufacturing margin was 23%. Now we know in Q4 that took a dive as Tesla experienced impacts of the chip shortage, some supply chain issues, and a few other items that were a drag on manufacturing margin. So in Q4, I estimated that fell to around 17%. I'm expecting a slight recovery in Q1 to 20%, and then I'm holding that flat at 23% going forward. Now, I do think we will continue to see manufacturing improvements over time. You can look at a lot of the things they're trying to do in Berlin and Austin to get an idea of some of the efficiencies Tesla is trying to target there. Now, if those were left alone in the current pricing structure, I do think we would see core manufacturing margin increase quite substantially over time. However, as we've described above, I do think that Tesla will continue to lower prices. So we have to temper our expectations for increasing manufacturing efficiency with the reality that the average sales price will continue to decrease over time. I do think that these two will slightly offset each other to some degree going forward. And for this reason, I'm assuming that the 23% figure that I calculated for Q3 2020 will hold for future periods. Next, let's talk about services and other. Historically, services and other has been a negative gross margin item for Tesla, although that has improved slightly in the previous quarters. I'm projecting that will continue to increase by about 1% per quarter before leveling out at a 0% or break even gross margin in the long term. I view Tesla's approach to the services and other line to really be a complement to the overall car ownership experience. The fact that Tesla will come to your house to do repairs is not about improving Tesla's bottom line. Rather, it's about improving the car ownership experience. Many viewers of the last video did notice that I excluded Tesla insurance from the valuation. I actually gave this quite a bit of thought, but ultimately decided that things like supercharging, vehicle repairs, and insurance are really more owner benefits and not cash cows for Tesla. In the decision to have mobile service, it really is more about improving the owner's satisfaction experience than it is about increasing Tesla's bottom line. I believe Tesla insurance will follow a similar suit, and so therefore I'm assuming it will be run at break-even, as will all of these ancillary services in the long term. 
We're then using these gross margin assumptions and adding back in the regulatory credits to come up with the total automotive gross margin excluding full self-driving. We're then removing the overhead costs which have been allocated to this portion of the business to come up with a total operating margin, or EBITDA. Note that this number excludes depreciation. Next let's talk about capital expenditures, or CapEx. I've assumed $5,000 per unit of capacity for automotive assembly. I then have this decreasing by about 5% per year going forward. This is due to some of the efficiencies that Tesla is likely to experience when they get rid of things such as the paint shop in the Austin plant for the Cybertruck, as well as some of their more generic assembly improvements. On top of the automotive capex, I've also assumed some battery capacity capital expenditures for the in-house capacity that Tesla will be building over time. I have used the historical expenditures at the Gigafactory as a baseline, but then assumed some improvements in future battery capacity plants. This section of the model ascribes a battery pack size for each of the vehicles that we have presumed will be delivered in each quarter, and we use this aggregate amount to come up with the quantity of gigawatt hours that Tesla Automotive will need for its vehicles. Now, some of these cells will be bought by third parties, but I also assume that Tesla will be building a significant amount of new battery capacity to support future growth. I'm assuming here that Tesla will be paying $70 million per gigawatt hour of capacity, but that this will also decrease by about 5% per year going forward. Adding in the total assembly capex with the battery capex, we get a total capex number that is applicable to the pure automotive hardware sales side. This is a number that I do think has been underestimated by many Tesla bulls within the community. Over the period of 2021 through 2030, I'm projecting that total capex for automotive hardware will reach $63 billion. This is obviously a large amount of money and does have a rather significant impact of the hardware-only portion of the valuation. I think this is one of the reasons that the hardware valuation is so much lower than the FSD and RoboTaxi valuation. Essentially, you have to spend over $60 billion just to build the plants that will build the vehicles that you need to sell to customers in order to have a chance at selling full self-driving software and robo-taxi rides. What this model is saying is that it's appropriate to take that hit at your hardware sales valuation, but that does leave a significant amount of upside for the full self-driving software as well as for the robo-taxi platform fees to become major drivers of high margin revenue. Tesla has said they want to have 3 terawatt hours of battery capacity between the automotive side of the business and the energy side of the business by the year 2030. This model projects 1 terawatt hour of capacity would be needed to support the automotive side of the business by the year 2030. Given the fact that we're assuming just over 12 million vehicle sales by the year 2030, this battery capacity figure does seem to pass the gut check. Now one last gut check item here. Row 135 gives us the final number in this model, which is the unlevered or debt-free pre-tax cash flow. This is the total cash flow that Tesla's automotive hardware sales are producing. As we mentioned in the last video, it does not make sense to back out certain corporate items, such as interest expense or taxes, on the pure automotive side of the business, since it's hard to allocate those to individual business lines. Rather, we have an unlevered pre-tax cash flow, which is essentially the cash flow that is available from the operations of the business, less the capital expenditures, and this is the amount that's used to pay debt holders and equity holders. Because this is a capital structure neutral cash flow, I've discounted it to the present value at a 6% discount rate, which represents the weighted average cost of capital rather than just the cost of equity. When we do this, we calculate a total enterprise value for this piece of the business of $442 billion. When we back out those corporate overhead items and back out the cash flows to debt holders, we calculate a total share price today of $328 per share. So that will do it for this portion of the valuation. In the next video, we'll be getting into the full self-driving and robo-taxi portion of the valuation, which is obviously going to be a major driver of value. So I hope you enjoyed that one. I hope you've enjoyed this one. Thanks so much for watching. A huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. I'm Matt Smith, and this is Spark Spread.